I am Net Nursing Prep and welcome to my channel. In today's video, we're going to be talking about how to best tackle those select all that apply questions. I know they're everybody's favorite questions. I didn't need to make this video. They're super easy, but I thought just for fun. No, I'm kidding. I know everybody hates them. They're hard. They're more challenging type questions. And so I thought I would make this video to make it a little bit easier or hopefully a little bit more easier for you guys. So the first thing you need to know, if you're not familiar with this type of question, this is considered an alternative format question. So it's not the basic, here's the question, A, B, C, D, one of these is the right answer. In select all and apply questions, there are multiple right answers. And actually that's the first rule to know. They will have always at least two correct answers. So if they give you five options, at least two of those are going to be correct. So if you read through it and you find, okay, this is a correct answer and then the rest of them aren't, you're missing one, right? Because there has to be at least two or else it wouldn't be a select all that apply. No partial credit is given. So let's say you get three out of the four choices. You almost get it right, okay? You get the question wrong still. It's still a zero. You don't get credit for getting part of it right. These are higher difficulty. These are more challenging questions. And we are seeing these more and more on NCLEX these days. So you're going to be seeing them more and more in school these days, right? Because our job is to prepare you for NCLEX. So yes, these are higher level functioning questions. You do have to think about these. These are not like, you know, straight up knowledge based questions. And some common examples of things that like to be select all that apply. Things that you can put into lists. So side effects, risk factors, functions of a body system, um, complications, and nursing interventions. These are all categories that are commonly used for select all that apply questions. So now that we're more familiar with this type of question, let's talk about my tips on how to handle them. Now let's discuss my strategies for best tackling these types of questions. The first thing is you have to understand what the question is asking. I see so many students get all wrapped up in the potential answers that they're not really paying attention to the question and then they end up getting it wrong. So make sure you read the question thoroughly and you understand exactly what it wants from you. And a lot of times what I would do is I would read the question and I'd already have potential answers in my head before I even read the options. So that's a good strategy too, because as you read the options, if something you thought of matches one of those, then you know it's the right answer. You want to look at each potential answer individually. So try to resist the temptation to go A, B, C, D, E and read them all the way down. Read them one at a time and then apply that one to the question. Then move on to B. So don't read them all at once. Read them one at a time. Don't look for similarities. You want to treat them all separately. So just like you're going to read them all one at a time, you're not going to try to compare them. You're not going to say, oh, well, option A and option D both have something to do with oxygenation. Therefore, they're related and they must be the right answers. No, do not do that because they could be related and the wrong answers, right? So just because they have similarities doesn't make them correct. So don't even bother trying to make similarities between each of the potential answers. Treat them as an individual one. Look at each potential answer and think, is this true? Is this false? Yes, no. So you'll read the question. Then you'll read your first option and you'll go, okay, does this apply to the question? Does this answer the question? Yes or no? And if it's yes, then it's probably the answer. So you're going to circle it. If it's no, then cross it off. And if you can actually like physically cross it off, there are actual studies that show like that's better for your brain. We can actually physically cross things off. And if it's on the computer and you can't do that, just, you know, mentally cross it off. So for this one though, it requires you to know a lot of content. And that's kind of the scariest part about select all that apply questions. It's you can't just go in knowing some stuff about this. You need to know everything about this because all of those potential things could be options. So you do need to know a lot of content and have a lot of knowledge on the topic that you're being asked about. Answer that, then move on. Do not go backwards. 
So you've answered option A, right? You've decided, yes, this is true or no, this is not, okay? Now go on to B and don't go, oh, well, B kind of makes me think of A. No, 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 don't do that, right? A doesn't exist anymore. You've either chosen it or you've crossed it off, okay? Now the only thing that exists is B. And then once you make your decision about B, go on to C, and now B doesn't exist anymore, okay? So think of them like that. You've got to treat them as individual answers. Of course, with this type of thing, any alternative format question, the best thing to do is practice, practice, practice. So do as many as you can. And there's lots and lots of resources where you can find practice questions. They are in your book, they're in your ATI book, they're on online resources for ATI, there's NCLEX review books you can use. There's lots and lots of places where you can find select all that apply questions. Make sure the choice has something to do with the question. That's another big one too. So yes, it might be a true statement. You might go, yes, that's true. But if it's not relevant to what the question is asking, then it's not right, right? So if the question is about diabetes and one of the potential answers says a normal pulse on an adult is 60 to 100 beats per minute. Yes, that is a true statement, right? That is a correct statement. But what does that have to do with diabetes, right? What does that have to do with the question you were asked? So making sure, even though it is a correct statement, does that statement have to do with the question? And then finally, if you're unsure or if the choice is something you've never heard of, you're not familiar with it at all, it's probably wrong, okay? It's likely the incorrect choice. Now, it could be the correct choice and you just don't know enough content, um, but kind of err on the side of caution. If you're like, I don't remember reading that, I don't remember her talking about that at all, then it's probably not one of the right answers. So now, after I've kind of given you my tips, let's do a practice question. Now let's do a practice question. Which of the following are contraindications to the induction of labor? So before we even read any of our choices, let's make sure we understand the question. So the question is asking, which of these options is going to be a reason somebody should not be induced? So first of all, this requires us to know what is induction of labor, right? And it also requires us to know what are some reasons somebody should not be induced. So you should already have a couple of those reasons in your head before we even check out the choices. So. Let's see some of our choices. The first one, because we're going to do these one at a time, right? Inactive genital herpes. So induction of labor is letting somebody give birth vaginally, right? And we know somebody who has active genital herpes does not get to give birth vaginally. So we want to induce that person. But what does this option say? It says inactive genital herpes. So it's perfectly fine for somebody like this to be induced and have a vaginal birth. So it's not a contraindication. And what are we looking for? We're looking for contraindications. So let's go ahead and cross this one out, okay? It's done, we're moving on. Going to be cephalopelvic disproportion. So this requires us to know what that is. So what that is, Little mama, big baby. That's how you can remember. Is it ideal for that person to give birth vaginally? No, they should not give birth vaginally. Therefore, induction of labor would be contraindicated. So we know, yes, this is one of our options. Circle it. Now we're going to move on. C, placenta previa. So what is a placenta previa? A placenta previa is when the placenta is implanted over the cervical os, and we already know, because we know a lot of content and knowledge, that a person who has a placenta previa has to have a C-section, right? So would it be appropriate for them to be induced for a vaginal delivery? No. But what are we looking for? Contraindications. So that's how we know, yes, this is one of our choices. Now we'll move on to D. Classical incision of the uterus. 
So a classical uterine incision is a vertical, so up and down incision, probably from like a previous surgery or a previous C-section, right? So we already know if somebody's had a classical incision, it's not safe for them to have a VBAC, right? They can't have a vaginal birth. It's not safe. So is it safe for them to be induced? No, right? Because they're not having a vaginal birth. So is it contraindicated? Yes. Yes, it is. And now moving on to our last one, E, history of an SGA infant. So the first thing we need to do is, do we know what SGA means? SGA means small for gestational age, so a little baby. So is having a little baby a reason you can't have a vaginal delivery? No, it has nothing to do with anything, right? It's not relevant to the question at all. So we can cross it off. So our answers are B, C, and D. We looked at them individually. We made sure we understood what the question was asking. And then we knew content to be able to answer all of these questions. So that was my video on how to conquer those select all that apply questions. I hope you found this helpful. Don't forget to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, please let me know. And if not, I'll see you on the next one.